The following is a video presentation of a lecture delivered by Dr. Mark Chrislip on September 19, 2010 at Portland State University in regards to vaccines and the myths and fallacies surrounding them. This is brought to you by Oregonians for Science and Reason in conjunction with Portland State University. You can and I'm getting some PTSD because after, I'm 32 years out of college and I still have nightmare taking tests, nightmares without taking tests. Just walking in this room gives me a cold sweat but I'm not prepared for the multiple choice test and I don't have an number two pencil. So we're in trouble. So I'll, um, you always start off when you give infectious disease talks or the doctor for conflicts of interest and I don't have any. I haven't talked to a drug rep for 25 years. Uh, this is the only day I've ever taken from a drug rep. You can't quite see it. It's a fleet cinema that the unison rep sent me because he didn't like what I was saying about him. It's still unused, I want to emphasize, in sitting on the, uh, <laughs> sitting on the uh, shelves in my office. And I proudly show it to all who come in. So what I'm going to do is go through sort of the general arguments that you hear. And if you don't, this is a hard talk to give in 50 minutes. Do you go broad or do you go narrow and deep? And I'm going to try and go broad, just touch on a bunch of topics rapidly about things that you hear um, about um, why you shouldn't trust vaccines, vaccine makers, and the data behind vaccines. And the first and all, one you always get is that we're nothing but shills for the medical industrial complex. Um, and I'm not. And most of the people I know are not. But one of the arguments you hear is about all these drugs, all these, all these vaccines, the studies are sponsored by Big Pharma. Um, they get paid to do them. Of course, they're going to have benefit and show good efficacy because they make a lot of money doing it. Now, it is true that funding source does determine the buy or the outcomes and studies, and that is something you have to factor into it whenever you read a series of clinical trials. And you have to figure that you got to look at the funding. If it's all pharmaceutical company funded, it's probably going to be biased a little bit in favor. The person who pays the bills always gets their results. But it's a subtle bias, not an all or nothing uh, phenomenon to invalidate the results. So someone says you can't trust it because it was sponsored by the pharmaceutical company. One, who else is going to pay for it? But two, the bias is there, but it's often a subtle bias. And you have to look at the quality of the study, not just the funding as to who, um, who did it. And you can see from this particular one from JAMA, which is always my favorite, um, is that basically, um, if it was funded by for-profit organizations, it was uh, found favorable 51% of the time. If it was a non-profit, it was only 30% of the time. But that's not a great problem. It's just a minor problem in medicine. And we all have to pay our bills. And so if you go to the two sites that are most out there about, age, about uh, vaccines and autism, one is Generation Rescue. Well, they got their people paying for it. And the other is Age of Autism. That's the ad you find on their website. You can't go to a website without finding Google ads on it. We all have our corporate masters that we bow down to. I bow down to Galaxo. They bow down to Nana's Cookies. And they probably get a better deal out of it because at least they get some cookies. But we're all biased by our finances. So you just have to have that up front and know that when you're going into uh, evaluating the studies. And so, you know, the hot calling the kettle black kind of deal, everybody and gets money from somebody. And I'm not getting wealthy vaccinating people. Actually, I don't make dime one when I recommend vaccinations. And in fact, for pediatricians, most, as this study shows, most pediatricians either break even or lose money when they get a vaccine. Vaccines is not a profit center for pediatricians. And this was a study that was published in the pediatrics. It basically showed that um, most of them are either break even or suffer financial losses for, for Vaccines. So when you when someone's saying vaccines, they're probably not making money from giving them if they're a physician. And um, actually in medicine these days, um, that's getting a problem. So let's talk about vaccines. Now you know that even though I'm not a corporate shill, I'm biased because somebody's paying my bills. Um, let's talk about vaccines. Um, and for me, vaccines have always been like fresh air and clean water. How can you be against it? It's like being against the flag and, and apple pie and mom. I mean, there's such good benefits. When I was going to medical school and residency, I never thought that anybody could possibly be against vaccines because they, they you know, the, the reason we all live through our 90s is flush toilets, um, good nutrition, and vaccines. That flush toilets favorite his health. Knowing the under, understanding how diseases is spread is key for for uh, breaking transmission of disease. If you know you figured out by coughing, you can do things that way. If you know to spread by eating 
uh, we'll drip contaminated water, you can stop the disease that way. The fact that that, that, and you'll see that people say, well, the rates of diseases were going down before vaccines started, and that's true. But we've wiped them off the face of the earth almost in some places because of vaccines. And it's always a multifactorial intervention that has led to the decrease in all these diseases. And when you read the anti-vaccine sites, they're very binary in their approach, a very yes or no, all or nothing. Either vaccines do it all or they don't do anything. And the effects of vaccines are part of multiple things that have been done over time. And for example, like I say here, tuberculosis used to affect a third of Europe. Now you don't see much TB anymore. And you don't have a vaccine, well, we do, but we don't use it in this country, uh, against tuberculosis, and it's still managed to disappear. But the final, you know, the final yards have been taken out uh, by vaccines and what they do. Um, and then there are a bunch of vaccines out there. So the efficacy of a given vaccine is very dependent on what type it is. There's live vaccines, there's killed vaccines, there are protein vaccines, there are carbohydrate, carbohydrate vaccines. There's all sorts. Each one has a different efficacy profile, a different toxicity profile. They're not all the same thing. It's like saying cancer is all the same thing. It's many different diseases. There's many different infections. There's many different vaccines. And each one is a different thing um, that the vaccines target. And remember, the goal of vaccines for those is that when you give a vaccine, you give a little bit of the organism so the immune system recognizes it. It develops an antibody against whatever it is. And then when you're exposed at a later date, either you don't get the disease as a rule or you get a less of disease. What, and you can see, um, in low-income countries, vaccine and infectious diseases are still predominant. It still amazes me that in the low-income, number three cause of death in children is diarrheal diseases, which kills millions of kids. <laughs> There's several hundred thousand cases of, of, um, of um, measles every year in the world, and tuberculosis. Infectious diseases, we don't see them a lot in the West because of both nutrition and, and, and hygiene and vaccines. But remember, the rest of the world is filled with these vaccines, and all, I'm sorry, <laughs> filled with these infections, and they are just an airplane flight away from coming to the Pacific Northwest or wherever we live. Now this is, when you give infectious disease talks, you always give, uh, show big tables and small numbers. In the old days, I used to shake them a lot, so no one could read it. But this shows, basically how infections have varied over the years, both before and after the vaccine. And if you look at the peak and the top row of diphtheria, it caused, um, um, before vaccines, 30,000 cases a year in 1938 and 3,000 deaths. In the vaccine period, diphtheria causes zero cases and zero deaths. That's what vaccines have done. So in 1938, we still we knew how the disease was spread. We knew how um, we had other interventions, but that was the amount of disease that we saw. In 1958, there were 763,000 cases of measles with 552 deaths. Contrast that with 2006, 55 cases of measles, zero deaths. That's what the measles vaccine has done for the population. And you can go through this table here uh, showing all the different diseases that used to affect hundreds of thousands of people with hundreds of deaths have gone down to zero cases, or almost zero cases, and no deaths. When you look at this list, I've never seen diphtheria, I've never seen measles, I've never seen pertussis, I've never seen, well, I saw one case of polio that was important. Uh, my best friend had rubella when he was in Japan, but that doesn't count. Never seen a case of smallpox. I've seen one case of tetanus as a fellow 25 years ago in a, in a, in a, in a Cambodian lady, never in the primary series. And I saw one case of mumps in a 45 year old male last year. And I see nothing but infectious diseases every day for the last 25 years. And I never see any of these diseases. They have virtually disappeared in large part thanks to vaccines. Hepatitis A vaccine, unfortunately, invasive pneumococcal disease vaccine. So if you look, the vaccines are estimated to have accounted for, since 1980, a 92% decline in diseases caused by vaccines and a 99% decrease in deaths. And in kids, I mean, the people who do pediatrics have never seen in a case now of invasive homophilus disease, homophilus influenza. It gets in the bloodstream of children, it causes meningitis, and they die fast, and if they survive, they're brain damaged, and it's a horrible illness. You can now go through your entire residency and never see a case of Haemophilus influenza B. It's wonderful how these diseases um, have disappeared, with the one exception that 
I get paid only when I see infection, so afterwards I will be standing with a sign outside that says we'll do infectious diseases for food, because this has really had an adverse effect on my positive income flow, and I'm looking forward to having these diseases come back. <laughs> and you can see the United States, I've never seen polio, I've never seen an iron lung, I've never seen measles, and smallpox has been eradicated for a while. The last case was in 1976. And we've been uh, it, it, smallpox free, except for a lab in the Soviet Union and a lab in the United States where it's all kept in a jar somewhere, which I'm sure they will release at some point um, in the future. <laughs> 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 they, but if you, go, uh, if you go and look at the security around the biological warfare parts of the old Soviet Union, your basic 7-Eleven has better security. <laughs> it's very scary when you see the rusty barbed wire and the drunken soldiers, <clears throat> and they don't protect their biologics, and they don't protect their nuclear weapons, and they've been sort of selling them on the side, and so you're always worried that something like uh, a polio, I'm sorry, like smallpox is, is going to come back. So, they have great benefit. They, were allowed, they have allowed us all to live in large part, uh, far longer than we should. <laughs> and, but as long as there's been vaccines, there have been people who are against them. As soon as Jenner started vaccinating against smallpox, people were objecting to smallpox vaccinations. And, and so and it's been going on since. And I'm going to stick primarily to sort of what's gone on in the last 10 years in the arguments against vaccine. And unlike the anti-vaxxers, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I feel that I am constrained to the truth. Um, I saw this story to tell the whole but the truth. That's what I got to do. And when you go to the web, as we'll see, you don't always see that the truth is something that people are particularly um, interested in. Yeah. Now, there's the philosophical, political viewpoint that institutions of government should not and cannot enforce their people to have vaccines. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, that's not a scientific question. That's a religious, philosophical, political question. I, of course, think everybody should be seatbelted in and wear a helmet and get a vaccine before they go. And I think uh, that uh, anybody who drives in the left lane of the freeway with a turn signal on should be eligible for physician-assisted suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Any sign of the papers, but I'm a hard case that way. And I'm going to talk about the scientific questions, which is safety and efficacy of the vaccines and the things that people say about the vaccines and whether or not they're true. And Vaccine fear is varied by culture, which I think is very interesting. The French are convinced that hepatitis B causes multiple sclerosis. So if you go to France, it's the hepatitis B vaccine that the French are worried about. And that's where they put all their energy in. The French don't care about the MMR. The French don't care about, um, uh, about mercury, um, both of which I think um, are bound up by good Bordeaux. But they do worry about hepatitis B causing multiple sclerosis. The Nigerians have a whole different problem. The Nigerian Islamic clerics decided that polio was a Western plot to spread HIV and to sterilize their population so that there would no longer be African Islamic Nigerians. It was a plot to kill them from AIDS and sterilize them. So what happened in Nigeria is that the northern part of the country, because of this fear that it was going to sterilize everybody, everybody quit using the polio vaccine. And they were just, we were so close to the world of eradicating polio, it was amazing. We like got right up to the edge and it was disappearing in virtually everywhere but a few scattered areas until this happened. And now polio has come back with vengeance and not only has it been in Nigeria, it's spread into adjacent, it's gone to India, it's gone to Pakistan, it's gone to Afghanistan. Polio has spread from Nigeria but what's even more annoying is that the best vaccine in the population um, for, um, for polio is the live vaccine. Now, a live vaccine has downsides. The live vaccine is live, it occasionally causes polio. But for polio, is the live vaccine. Now, a live vaccine has downsides. The live vaccine is live, it occasionally causes polio. But Nigeria was a perfect storm of, of a lack of general immunity because people weren't using it. HIV, which allowed people to not control the disease, and the impact of HIV in Africa on all sorts of infections is a topic in and of itself. But one of the things that's happened is that because you have an HIV population and, and you don't have um, 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 a, a herd immunity, the polio vaccine started multiplying in the community 
And now the disease is caused by a vaccine-derived strain. In the last 20 years, it has mutated, and as it's mutated, it's become more virulent, and now it's causing disease in, um, in Nigeria. And so now, uh, now that well, wild, case, wild type polio is still spreading throughout Nigeria, a significant subset of the disease is also being spread by the polio-derived strain. And that's actually happened before in other places where the, the vaccine strain has kind of cut loose and spread. And one of those is a whole different uh, uh, sideline. But it looks like um, the uh, smallpox strain got into the cow population and mutated, and it's causing cowpox in South America. And then this cowpox is slowly coming north. So maybe if we're lucky, um, we'll see smallpox again as it jumps from cows into humans. I mean, measles, they think, jumped from cows into humans about 20,000 years ago. It's a disease called render pest. And so humans have gotten all these diseases from other animals. HIV probably came from chimpanzees. And our animals have long provided infectious diseases for us over time. But now, um, anyway, I, Dr. Um, I go off on tangents. Dr. Tangent is my name. Um, but if everybody's vaccinated, that won't happen with, with polio. But it is now a big problem in Nigeria um, as a result. Now, to put those 300 cases of vaccine-derived uh, polio in perspective in the world, Last year, there were 10 billion doses. Uh, uh, 10 vaccine years, they gave 2 billion kids 10 billion doses of an oral uh, vaccine. Uh, and during that time, 33,000 kids had wild polio, uh, which is a lot of kids to get paralyzed from polio. And 3.5 million cases of polio, they estimate, were prevented by the oral vaccine. So this is one of these fine points that never would have happened if the clerics had decided that polio was responsible for sterility and uh, HIV in their population. Now, um, nobody here thinks that the polio virus is going to cause you to be sterile to have HIV. We have other problems. And we're going to sort of the big three I'm going to touch on now is mercury and autism, which has been a big thing for years, the MMR and autism, the too many too soon, which is a common refrain of the anti vaccine people and then uh, toxins in the vaccine. And as I've said many times before, five out of four Americans don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Those things are I read these things, and as I go, I add things that don't want to go back to change. I actually spell checked this talk, which I'm very, very used to my talks. So, um, it had to uh, give it to an audience who might care. Um, most of the time, the talk is usually closing in the audience. Residents have been saying, so I don't really have to spell it. Now, autism, I'm not, I'm not an autism expert, I'm an infectious disease specialist. So, all I can say is that autism has been increasing as a diagnosis in the United States. Most likely and primarily due to a combination of expanded diagnostic criteria and increased awareness of the disease. And that people are, when you become aware of the disease and you start making the diagnosis based on not looser criteria, but recognizing that it's a spectrum, even have minor manifestations of diseases and still have the disease that more people are being diagnosed with autism. And that's very true of a lot of infections, like, you know, my favorite is toxic shock syndrome. Classic toxic shock syndrome is a whole bunch of characteristics. But every once in a while you see a patient who sort of has it but doesn't meet all the criteria, but you know they actually have that disease. They just didn't have the full-blown uh, manifestations of toxic shock. And that happens with a lot of illnesses in the United States uh, that you see. Now, do vaccines cause autism? Uh, autism? No. But here's the thing is that autism usually starts to manifest around the time the kids are getting their maximum vaccines. So there's an association here. This is, and, and always remember that association is not causation. But you have to be very sympathetic to a parent whose kid has, gets a bunch of vaccines, and then during around that time, they start to manifest autistic uh, autism. And it's hard to say, no, it wasn't. I mean, 25 years ago, you'd say, well, I don't know. I mean, they're getting all these vaccines. We're starting to see autism. Is there cause and effect? The answer is answered now, but at one time it was a legitimate question to ask because, you know, what's up these poor kids? And random awful things happen all the time to people. My whole career is based on people getting awful diseases for no damn good reason and ended up trying to die in the ICU. But what do I have my disinfection? Well, I don't know. Do the best I can. You usually don't know the reason. There are 25,000 heart attacks in the United States every week. 
Now it's, it's September. We're giving out lots of flu vaccine to everybody we can give it to. While you're giving out the flu vaccine, a lot of people are going to have heart attacks. If you get a vaccine and you have a heart attack in 24 hours, you're going to blame the vaccine. So you have to look to see if the rates of these diseases go above what you would expect in the baseline. The 300 severe allergic reactions, 300 people have an anaphylactic shock. They try and die of allergies every week in the United States. So you have a whole bunch of kids getting garden silk to prevent HPV. And during this time, some of them, just by statistical chance, are also going to have an anaphylactic reaction. Did the anaphylactic reaction come from the vaccine? Well, if you had the vaccine the day you had the anaphylactic reaction, you personally are going to blame the vaccine. But you're going to have to look at the overall populations to see, are those rates higher than the people getting the vaccine compared to people who don't get the vaccine? And that kind of information is very difficult to tease out um, in populations. And because random crap happens all the time to people for no damn good reason, and human beings like to find patterns in random crap. And that's why you can look at the clouds and see a bunny rabbit or Abraham Lincoln. There ain't no bunny rabbit in the clouds. It's just a cloud. And we see patterns that don't exist. So, um, so there are a lot of issues with the vaccines, you know, and whether or not they cause these diseases. And I very well know, and there's a lot of, um, well, you can listen to the Skeptic Guides of the Universe. Um, last week's podcast had a real nice discussion on human psychology. And basically, one good story is worth more than every study I'm going to talk about. And I recognize that. And I have to talk that with my patients who think that they have a process where I know they almost certainly do not. And it's hard to argue the data against a personal story of someone who has suffered from some process. And these are difficult things to deal with when you're one-on-one -on -one with patients in, in, in the hospital. But the motto, of course, of every skeptic um, is the plural of anecdote is anecdotes, not data. <clears throat> the plural of data is datum, data. Data. Singular. Data. Singular. Data. Data. What's the plural of dirt? See, I lost the scramble game over this, and I'm still bitter. I still <laughs> says to my wife that the plural of dirt is dirts. <laughs> yes, dirts. Yeah. Yeah, you're not having dirt. Sorry? <laughs> anyway. Uh, mercury is a vaccine. Let's start with mercury. So, mercury is a neurotoxin, and there's no doubt about that. That's what caused the Mad Hatter to be mad. The Hatters in the old times would use mercury to cure their hats, and they all went crazy. So the Mad Hatter had reason to be uh, um, crazy. Uh, but that's elemental mercury. Now my brother and I, we used to break all the mercury thermometers and play around with that stuff, and we were wild. Them did me any horror. I don't know. Um, but if, if you, why, when you read the stuff on the interwebs about mercury, you got to ask the question, what mercury are they talking about? Like chlorine gas killed thousands in World War I. Sodium chloride um, is pretty harmless unless someone hits you on the head with a Morton salt bottle. I mean, salt is not a hard chlorine under those circumstances is not harmful. So people talk about the toxicity of mercury. Mercury is a neurotoxin. The stuff that I played with out of the thermometer when I was a kid Probably not so much the stuff in the vaccine, because the stuff in the vaccine is thimerosal. It was used until recently as a preservative in a vaccine. It was removed from most of the vaccines except for multi-dose influenza, I think some tetanus in about 2000. Um, to put it in perspective, how much mercury is in a six ounce chunk of tuna? I found that uh, if you eat six ounces of tuna, uh, you get uh, almost 9,000 micrograms of methyl mercury in organic mercury. Um, whereas a maximum dose that a kid could have been exposed to when the mercury was at its most in the vaccine was 187 micrograms. So you know you have far more mercury now kids are small, kids have developing brains, they're different than adults chowing down on the on the chicken of the sea. But you have to remember that you don't they didn't get that much mercury in the vaccine. And it was ethyl mercury. And ethyl mercury is not the same as methyl mercury, which is not the same as the stuff my brother and I used to play with uh, in the backyard when my parents were there. They're learning all sorts of stuff, I guess. <laughs> so that's the chemical compound of, of thimerosal. It is not mercury. I mean, there's mercury in it. And there's, sulfa in, um, there's sulfur in Lasix, for anybody here on Lasix. 
And if you were to chow down on a, on a, on a gram of sulfur, you would not have a, have a good time for it. So there hasn't been, so what's the data? There's now about a dozen studies out there that have looked and tried to tease out whether or not mercury is the primary cause of autism. And uh, you can get the full nine yards for that um, at science-based medicine um, um, where I go together one of the ones. The most compelling data, I think, is autism rates since they took mercury out of the vaccine. And even though they've taken mercury out of all the vaccine and no one's getting any more mercury in the vaccine, autism rates continue to fall. So you think that if it was due to the mercury in the vaccines, then if you took it all out, the kids would stop getting autism, and it just hasn't happened. I think of all the studies out there, that's the most compelling epidemiologic data to show that vaccines don't cause autism. And there are multiple other ones, but I found that one to be uh, the most compelling of the group. Um, and there have said, been at least 10 other epidemiological studies since the last decade that have looked very hard because, you know, unlike the, I don't want to, no one in medicine wants to hurt people. We want to make them better. We look for a relationship between dimerosal and autism, and we haven't been able to find a good relationship. Um, so I think that this has pretty much been a non-starter, and that I think the data, as best you can determine, is pretty clear that thimerosal is safe, that thimerosal does not cause, uh, is not associated with autism, and mercury is a non-starter as a cause of autism in, in kids. Now, um, adjuvants, they do now currently, aluminum is the um, adjuvant that's being used to make some vaccines work better, and that's the current, um, excuse me, toxin that they're pointing at that causes autism. Now we have to repeat those studies looking at aluminum. There are not many, there are no studies that I've found in reviewing this topic to look at aluminum and autism. But again, the amount of aluminum is very tiny and is probably unlikely to cause uh, uh, autism. Uh, the problem with this currently though is that if you think your child has autism due to mercury, you can go get your hair tested for mercury levels. You can go get your urine tested for mercury levels. There are a bunch of labs out there that do non-standard testing um, for the, for Lyme, for all these other diseases, and then they give people therapy to bind the mercury to try and reverse the autism. This, and the big one they use is chelation therapy, where they inject the kid with intravenous stuff to bind up the mercury. It also binds up the calcium, and it's killed a couple of autistic children who've gotten uh, chelation therapy for disease that did not do this etiology, and uh, they've gotten, gotten this and died. So this is not without its downsides when people think that mercury uh, is a cause of autism. And all of you probably are aware of the uh, Do No Harm uh, website where you can find all the different side effects from these different interventions. Yeah. How about uh, the MMR and autism? Well, 1998, Dr. Andrew Wakefield published a pretty unimpressive study, if you actually go read it, um, about kids with autism and whether or not they had uh, uh, colitis, inflammation of the colon, and whether or not they had um, um, measles from the vaccine causing colitis and autism. And he had 12 children who had autism, and he did extensive evaluations. All these kids got colonoscopies. Anybody heard a colonoscopy yet? Yeah. Ain't fun, is it? I wouldn't want to do it to kids. He did it to the kids without getting proper, uh, what's the word, um, authority oh, from the, um, uh, here, the powers of the, you know, when you do studies, you get uh, people oh, man. The ethics panel. The ethics panel, thank you. He did LPs on all these kids, which is not part of the standard book. And he found um, that they had chronic inner colitis that he thought was associated with He not find an association between the vaccine and uh, I had uh, uh, an autism. We need to do more studies. And every study in medicine ends with, we need to do more studies. And he said, if there is, we need to keep looking. He did, however, say at his press conference, the vaccine causes autism. So he had a press conference where he said that, and it set off a storm in, in not so great Britain. Um, and said that the kids should not get the MMR, they should get three separate shots, they'll do better that way, that they won't get autism, and that's the secret to autism. And this was a conclusion that wasn't supported by the paper. Now this is what was discovered later about Dr. Wakefield and why his study was retracted from the Lancet. He was paid 500,000 pounds by a British lawyer in the two years leading up to this to do research to prove a link between autism and the vaccine. 
So he specifically paid half, half a million pounds, which in American money would be like 27 cents. Um, <laughs> and when you get paid, you're supposed to mention that. You're supposed to mention your conflicts of interest as part of your ethics for uh, publishing studies. And he didn't bother to do that. He also didn't mention that he had a patent for a single dose vaccine. Uh, this, I mean, I started this out by saying, you know, follow the money and stuff like that stuff. Uh, it may or may not be germane, but he had a patent for a single dose measles vaccine. And he went and said, everybody should get a single dose measles vaccine. And most importantly, is they went back and they looked at the records of the kids who he said regressed after they got the vaccine, and most of them already had symptoms of measles before he said they did. What he did in this paper is he lied. So we had two problems with this paper that got it rejected from the Lancet. He was unethical because he didn't mention he was getting half a, mil half a million pounds uh, to do studies, but he also lied. And as I mentioned earlier, he also did studies on kids that weren't approved by the ethics board. And a lumbar puncture and a colonoscopy for a study is something you do as an ethical physician that you'd want to get permission from the board to do. <laughs> and, I, and they're very uh, picky that way. So consequently, as you probably know, his study was retracted, and just two weeks ago, he got his license yanked in uh, England to practice medicine. Oddly enough, however, he's still considered a hero um, in the autism world of people who think that vaccines cause autism. And they call this a public lynching and shaming of Dr. Ruth Wakefield. It's unwarranted and overwrought, according to, who was this? David Kirby on the, uh, the Huffington Post. <laughs> <laughs> There's ever been a source of information that's wrong with the medical part of the Huffington Post. Uh, that's a whole different topic. I mean, the guy got a, I mean, to me, the guy's a dirtbag, but not everyone thinks so. There have been, though, if you publish a study, you're going to have to do more studies. So has this study been validated by others? No, it has not. People have said, well, is this true? Is it causing colitis? Is it causing regression? Is it causing autism? And so there's been at least three studies that have shown no. They've looked to see if kids have uh, more uh, colonic disease. They do not. They've looked to see if the MAR and autism is correlated. They have not. They've looked for measles in the colons of kids and not found it. it the best study was this one out of um, pediatrics, I think, which they tried to repeat it. And they looked for the presence of autism and enteropathy in kids with measles, and they could not find it. So I did it. Did all, and so, Part of the consequence of this study is a whole bunch of kids got to have other studies done to try and replicate his work, which turned out to be fraudulent. This is a study out of Poland where they looked at the presence of autism in people who got no vaccine, and people who got one vaccine, and people who got the classic MMR. And your, the vaccines were protected. No vaccines had higher autism rate than one vaccine, which had higher autism rates than the, the classic MMR vaccine. Now, this could be just study noise. It's going to have to be repeated. Because when you do epidemiologic studies, you often get data that may not be true. So this may not be true. However, measles affects the brain. Uh, 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 Chickenpox affects the brain. Uh, mumps affects the brain. These are all neurotropic agents. And there's always been this literature about uh, is some forms of mental illness an infectious disease? So there's some suggestion, and there's some data that suggests, for example, that some people with schizophrenia are tipped over by having infectious diseases. There's a virus called Bordovirus, where if you infect mice, they get OCD with it. They keep doing the same repetitive stuff. And I've seen a couple of cases over the years where some young person has had an acute uh, schizophrenic break. For some reason, they get a spinal tap, and they have a aseptic meningitis. So I would not be surprised, and again, this is all hypothetical. But if anything, this one study out of Poland suggests that the vaccine is protective for autism, and if infections could potentially tip people over in the subset, it could make some sense. On the other hand, it could all just be noise and nobody do further studies to show that it's true. However, um, in England, they now had, uh, I think, 3,000 cases of measles and 7,000 cases of mumps. And I always like it when people say, only one death. Um, I don't know about you guys, but one death of a kid is one death to me. I'm not a big fan of people dying. I get to see it all the time. It's not one of my favorite things to have people do. One death 
because at India vaccinated is one death too many. And the nice thing about this is that with the MMR, the M of course stands for mumps. England's had 7,500 cases. There's now an outbreak of mumps on the East Coast because some kid who was unvaccinated in the religious community who went over to England and brought back mumps with them. And there's now 1,500 cases of mumps uh, uh, in the population of New England and, I'm sorry, New York and New Jersey that's been spread primarily in the religious communities that are not vaccinated, but there are also cases in the, uh, in the, in the other communities um, in the, uh, as well. And, and um, um, the MMR, um, the lack is not, the mumps part of the vaccine is the worst part. So they've also had 55 kids who've gotten uh, bad or hepatitis, testicular inflammation as a consequence of getting uh, mumps. So um, that's the big fear in young adults. Kids, one in a million, get encephalitis, which is the uh, worst disease. So when you have clusters of non-immune people, you're going to get these diseases to perpetuate. And the biggest, the most under-vaccinated county in the United States is currently Jackson, Oregon. And the city is Ashland, where 25% of people, of kids in school, are unvaccinated uh, or not completely vaccinated in Ashland. Ashland, where 25% of people, of kids in school, are unvaccinated uh, or not completely vaccinated in Ashland. So, interestingly, Ashland also has the highest autism rate reported in Oregon. So, I just point out that the more kids there that are unvaccinated epidemiologically, they have a higher, now there's a lot of factors that go into that, but my biggest recommendation on the basis of this data, when you go to the Shakespearean Festival, do not <laughs> I used to, I went, to, I went to the University of Oregon, and that was really good advice to use up, for different reasons. But my youngest is going to Ashland next week for the Shakespearean Festival, and at least he's up to date on his vaccines. Uh, uh, and most of the unvaccinated are clustered in upper income private schools. Um, the, the big data is out of California. Some of the upper income private schools have 80, 90 percent unvaccinated rates. The big one around here is the Waldorf schools. Um, if, you, uh, if you go by a Waldorf school again, hold your breath. Um, there's a high, high probability that the kids in there are not vaccinated. Okay, so it's not the mercury, it's not the aluminum, it's not the MMR. It's too many vaccines too soon. You saw that at the beginning. We're giving these kids buckets of shots, buckets of antigens. They're getting an onslaught of infections, an onslaught of antigens. Can you be at any surprise if they're having problems with that? Now you look at this, the kids get five live attenuated vaccines and 21 different antigens by age six. Does that seem like a lot to you or a little to you? Maybe we should give more. And Dr. Bob Sears uh, is the biggest proponent of this alternative schedule uh, of vaccines. Now just remember, that there are 10 to 100 times more bacteria in you and on you than there are cells of you. You may think you're smart, but you're just sentient transport media for bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> but these are thousands of species, most of which we can't identify. So you have 100 million bacteria in and on you, and they're all kept at bay by your immune system. And your kids acquire this complex flora by the first year of their life. And they have to respond to it with an inflammatory, an immune response. So they already, in their first year of their life, to their normal flora that they acquire from their parents primarily, have been exposed to hundreds of thousands of antigens and made hundreds of thousands of antibodies to the bugs that they're exposed to shortly after being born. I always did a count in my ID textbook, my Infectious textbook, and I counted up 1,374 potential common infections that we can be exposed to in our life. And I guess only counting salmonella once. Okay, you can be exposed to salmonella multiple, multiple times. But you are exposed to at least eight to 10 viral infections a year when you're a kid, four to six when you're an adult. The amount of antigens and bacteria infections that you are wallowing in at any time is enormous compared to the number of antigens and infections that we give in the vaccine. It's estimated that most people in their lifetime make between a million and a hundred million antibodies. Um, and we have the ability to make 10 billion, I feel like Carl Sagan now, 10 billion antibodies to antigens. So if you think about this, if, you make, if your kid is exposed to just one antigen a day, which is a conservative estimate, He's, that's going to represent, compared to what he gets in the vaccine antigen load, it's going to be about 0.69%. 
I mean, compared to what your kid is getting, especially if he goes to daycare and wallows in the snot and school of every other kid, is insignificant compared to what he's going to get from the vaccines. This is a minor component to the infections and the antigens that people get every single day of our lives. And that's not including the stuff we get when we eat, when we walk, when we dive into the Willamette River, etc. And so if you look at the alternative schedule, not only is that the alternative schedule for, uh, I mean, the schedule for vaccines is not that much, it also represents the infection schedule. And if you don't give the kids the vaccines, as the, as the herd immunity declines, they become at risk. And young kids can get quite ill from these diseases. Now, does the alternative schedule prevent autism? Well, I don't know. But there was an interesting study in pediatrics, this just published last month, that looked at kids who had regular schedule and who had the altered schedule. They delayed vaccines and didn't get it in them. And they did neuropsychiatric testing, just a whole bunch of things to see how well their brains function. And the kids that had the delayed schedule did worse on 12 different outcomes in, what was it, 42 different outcomes. They did worse on 12 of them. Um, again, this may be background noise because this often happens when you look at multiple uh, outcomes in these kinds of studies. But when you combine that with the Polish study that shows the kid that the MMR was protective, you have this study that shows the people who get the vaccines at the regular schedule do better with brain functioning later in life, it sort of hints that perhaps the vaccines are more beneficial to the kids, and they certainly haven't been shown to cause harm to the kids. But it's not too many too soon, of course. It's all the toxins that are in the vaccines. That's sort of the fourth big gambit that you have. This is a quote from uh, my favorite anti-vaccine person, uh, Jenny McCarthy, uh, who basically says um, it shouldn't be polio versus autism. Fortunately, it's not. But are there toxins? If you could, it's always fun to go to the websites and, and read all the different toxins that are allegedly in vaccines. And the answer is yes, there are toxins in the vaccines at amounts that are so minuscule as to probably be unimportant, unless you believe in homeopathy, where less is more. <laughs> uh, my favorite example, and you can go through this with any of the things on the list, is from Ella. This is from a website. This is all the side effects that you can get from um, um, formaldehyde. It's a preservative. I mean, again, uh, my cadaver in medical school, saturated with formaldehyde, always guarantee me a, a bus seat on the way home. Uh, no one will sit next to you if you've been working with formaldehyde all day. It's the best way to get a, a seat on a TriMet bus. But, and again, maybe this is my talk. <laughs> But how much is in the vaccines, okay? That, and they measure it, less than a milligram, less than 0.1 milligram. Now, um, how much is a milligram? A dollar bill weighs a gram. So a milligram would be a thousandth of a dollar bill. 0.1 would be a tenth of a thousandth of a dollar bill. That gives you an idea. Uh, for those of you who cocaine, I could probably use a cocaine metaphor, but I could use the dollar bill metaphor for how much a gram is. There's not a lot to, well, how does this compare to the real world? Well, I want my kid to get uh, a cadaver preservative as part of their vaccines. Formaldehyde is also part of your normal metabolism. When your body is processing, you know, going through its many metabolic steps, you are all making formaldehyde right now. You are all making an ounce and a half of formaldehyde every day. I put that in whiskey terms, you know how much a, a year and a half of whiskey is going to be. That's how much formaldehyde you make every day as part of normal metabolism versus a tenth of a hundred, a tenth of a thousandth of a dollar bill, which is found in the vaccine. And you got to weigh how much. And the vaccine will prevent you from dying or getting ill from these illnesses. So you make formaldehyde, and you make formaldehyde in everything. It's found normally in your blood at parts, one to two parts per million is actually at a higher concentration than is found in the vaccine. So if you're using osmosis and you stick the vaccine in, you should actually get more from formaldehyde going into the vaccine site than going out of the vaccine site, <laughs> because that is the concentration going to the <laughs> And you can get through, and you can go through this with every single thing on the vaccine. Um, and you go through all the list, and there are things in there that I would not want to chug lug in a glass, but I would not worry me if it was present in tiny amount. And remember, the dihydrogen monoxide kills nine people <laughs> Every day. I like the way the CDC describes it to you. They say nine people 
die of unplanned round It's like, unplanned? I'm going to die of planned drowning. <laughs> <laughs>